Hello, good afternoon there. I'm Gail Robinson, Professor of Clinical Neuropsychology at the Queensland Brain Institute and School of Psychology. I'm also an NH and MRC Dementia Research Fellow. My research involves the early detection of dementia and personalised interventions. I also run a dementia diagnosis service right here at the University of Queensland, and this is open to the public. It's my very great privilege today to chair this session and then warmly welcome all of you to join us in our Dementia Research at UQ webinar. This is being held as part of Dementia Action Month. First, I would like to acknowledge the Turbul and Jaguar people as traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which the members of the panel meet today. I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So turning to today's topic, today we're talking about dementia. What is dementia? Well, it's simply an umbrella term that means there's been a change in your thinking skills or cognition. Our cognitive skills include things like memory, language, attention, vision, decision-making, understanding emotions, amongst a number of other skills. Dementia refers to a measurable decline in any of these skills. And there are many types of dementia. It has many faces. For example, some people first notice changes in memory, others changes in language, while others, again, might notice changes in vision or attention. So there are different types. It's complex, but today we're going to hear from some experts in the field, and we're hearing about what research is being done here at the University of Queensland. I'd like to warmly welcome my fellow panel members. Today, it's Professor Jürgen Gotz, Dr. Nadika Disanyaka, and Professor pa Nancy Pahana. So welcome everybody. And what I really think is wonderful about UQ is that our research spans across many areas, from fundamental or basic neuroscience at the molecular and cellular level, to cognitive assessment and clinical diagnosis of dementia, and then all the way to care and prevention in the community and aged care settings. I know that I'm quite excited to hear from our speakers today. So first, let me introduce you to Professor Jürgen Gotz. Now, Jürgen is the director of the Clem Jones Centre for Aging Dementia Research here at the Queensland Brain Institute. Professor Gotz is an expert in basic research in Alzheimer's disease, focusing on the cellular and molecular mechanisms of how tau and amyloid cause degeneration in the brain. Recently, he's developed an ultrasound treatment that's non-pharmacological and can remove toxic amyloid tau in mice and restore memory function. This means that in the future, ultrasound may be a new treatment for diseases of the brain. So please, it's my pleasure to hand over now to Jürgen. Yeah, hello. My name is Jürgen Götz. I will talk about challenges and potential solutions in treating Alzheimer's disease. My first of two slides talks about the challenges in treating Alzheimer's disease and also about 200 or so failed clinical trials in dementia. I'm often asked what the difference is between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. As you have just heard, Alzheimer's disease is just one form of dementia, accounting for approximately two thirds of all cases. However, there are at least two dozen additional types of dementia, and some are quite rare. The same drug is often tested first in Alzheimer's disease and subsequently in some rarer dementias, for example, progressive supranuclear palsy, a form of frontotemporal dementia. And the reason simply is that they share the tau pathology I will talk about in my second slide. When we, re when we refer to treating Alzheimer's disease, we don't always mean to eradicate the disease fully. What we mean is to come up with a disease-modifying strategy such that at the, age of, at the age of onset becomes delayed towards the end of a lifespan. The question then is, why is it so difficult to treat Alzheimer's disease? There are many reasons. 
there is the long disease duration, biochemical changes occur decades before the disease shows. There's a lack of robust biomarkers, which makes it difficult to differentially diagnose and monitor therapies. And of course, there's a blood-brain barrier, which keeps 98% of all drugs developed for brain diseases out of the brain. And secondly, a few drugs seem to fix some biochemical changes, but they fail to improve cognition. What I'm talking about in my second slide is a potential solution, therapeutic ultrasound. Let me come back to Alzheimer's disease and the Alzheimer's brain. What you see on the left is a brain section. And what we have stained here are the so-called amyloid plaques and the tau tangles. And we believe that they, especially the tau tangles, cause the Alzheimer brain to degenerate. Neurons die, their connections are severed, and this leads to memory loss. In the lab, as shown at the bottom, we have generated Alzheimer's mice by introducing mutations which run in families with Alzheimer's disease. When we look at the mice, they look pretty normal from the outside. However, they develop Alzheimer's plaques, they develop Alzheimer's tangles, and as expected, they are cognitively impaired. At the Queensland Brain Institute, we have a whole arsenal of techniques which allows us to analyze these mice and to understand how the disease develops. We also got an excellent tool by having these mice in which to test therapies. In other words, we first gave the mice some form of disease and now we want to fix them. This is where therapeutic ultrasound comes in. And work started around 2013. We found that ultrasound can be used to clear tau tangles and amyloid plaques in our Alzheimer's mice. We showed that memory can be restored even in very old mice. Our first ultrasound study was published in 2015 in Science Translation Medicine showing that ultrasound can cure Alzheimer's mice. However, when you look at the right of the slide, I think you can appreciate how tiny a mouse brain is in comparison to a human brain also the mouse skull is extremely thin, whereas the human skull attenuates ultrasound massively. We therefore had to invest several years to translate the findings in mice, such that they become useful in a human application. Starting with a small device, and this is not shown to scale, we have since increased our knowledge base and developed a device shown on the right that will be used in an upcoming safety trial. We have still a long way to go, we appreciate that, but we have made major strides forward and we are hopeful that the ultrasound technology will eventually be used by clinicians to treat brain diseases. Thank you. Thanks, Jürgen. So let me just follow up and um, we've actually already got a, a question here, and I think you've touched on this, that how do other types of dementia differ from Alzheimer's disease in the changes in the brain cells? You were talking about the different types of dementia with frontotemporal dementia. I, I think that refers to this question. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, obviously we have different ways how we look at dementias. I'm a biochemist, so I look at the brain of someone with dementia from a biochemical or histopathological angle. So what I see in any type of dementia is the deposition of protein aggregates. In Alzheimer's disease, we got amyloid plaques and tau tangles. In Huntington's, Huntington's disease, Huntington, and prion disease, prion protein. In Parkinson's disease, uh, alpha synuclein. And in a subset of frontotemporal dementia, tau deposits. And depending on which brain area is affected, obviously this leads to particular clinical features. And you refer to the scale, you spoke about behavioral uh, symptoms and language problems. This is all related to the frontal and temporal cortex, where tau deposits. In Alzheimer's disease, one finds plaques and tangles in the hippocampus at an early stage, and this brain area has a role in memory functions. So depending on where this changes occur, we find particular clinical features. And this then makes up the differences between the different types of dementias. 
Yes, and can I just also ask, um, isn't there a new drug just out which has been approved by the FDA that might target some of these changes or problems? Yeah, absolutely. The drug's name is aducanumab or aduherm, and it may be shocking for those who know about it because being approved in the US by the FDA just a few months ago, the cost will be staggering 56,000 US dollars per patient per year. Now, this antibody has shown in clinical trials, there actually have been two phase three clinical trials. One showed clinical benefits, cognitive improvements, and the other not. And it was then concluded that this is related to the cumulative dose of the antibody over a long time. Now, we need to know that when we think of an antibody, it's only one out of thousand antibodies which is given, which actually enters the brain only one out of thousand so it's a tiny fraction and this explains the costs but also why the drug may not be particularly effective and we have shown in mice when we combine aducanumab with ultrasound that we can increase the uptake six to ten fold and we see also improved cognitive function so we believe that ultrasound is actually a great tool to deliver therapeutic antibodies such as aducanumab Mm -hmm. So, you know, my research involves uh, developing yeah. cognitive assessment tools to actually detect yeah. these changes. And that's one of the challenges with diagnosing dementia is that, you know, some people have trouble with memory, others with mm. language, others with vision. Sometimes people just become more impulsive or even unmotivated in behavior, changes in eating more, etc. I guess one of the fundamental questions I want to ask you as well is, do you think these drugs can actually target specific changes in cognition and behavior. So some help with, you know, language, others with vision. Is that possible now? Or do you think it's going to be possible in the future? I would hope so. I mean, again, it depends on how you look at these diseases. And I look at these diseases from a biochemical and histopathological viewpoint. So I would argue that let's say we get we have tau aggregating in areas which have a role in executive functions or in language. By being able not only to prevent tau aggregation, let's say with an anti-tau antibodies, as we try to do, or amyloid aggregation with aducanumab, it's not so much only about removing these aggregates, but basically removing the steps leading to them. So we, the therapies aim to remove these aggregates at a stage when they are starting to form. They, they, they try to intervene at a stage when tau and amyloid starts to aggregate well before one can see these nice, beautiful deposits in an Alzheimer's brain. So I'm, I'm convinced by being able to, re, to, to prevent the formation of these protein aggregates at an early stage, that one should also be able to, um, to prevent uh, cognitive impairment. But on the other hand, I mean, coming back to ultrasound, I believe that ultrasound does more than remove amyloid and tau. It's almost a cognition enhancement tool. So it's addressing or attacking the disease from different angles. And I think that makes it particularly powerful. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jürgen. That's been very enlightening already. Um, thank you. I'm going to thank now turn to our second speaker. And I would like to introduce to you Dr. Nadika Disinyaka, who, like myself, is an NHMRC Boosting Dementia Research Fellow. Nadika is head of the Dementia and Neuromental Health Research Unit at UQ Center for Clinical Research. She examines methods to improve identification and treatment of neuropsychiatric manifestations in people with Parkinson's disease. She uses neuroimaging and biofeedback mechanisms to optimize treatment outcomes, and that's specifically for Parkinson's disease dementia. So my pleasure to welcome you, Nadika, and I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thank you, Gail. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, a range of clinical trials that are conducted in the space of dementia within uh, at UQ. Um, Within our clinical trials, um, it, they're divided into both dementia prevention and dementia care. Uh, there is a, a number of clinical trials that we have, and I'll talk a little bit about the dementia prevention study, which is focusing on a repurposed drug to reduce the risk of memory impairment in people with Parkinson's disease. 
and that's named as trip study. So in this study, in Parkinson's disease, as, as you heard, is people with Parkinson's disease de develop dementia at very advanced stages of the disease. In fact, uh, research suggests that about 80% of people with Parkinson's develop dementia at very early stages. But before people develop dementia, we can see that about 40% of people um, have memory impairment at very early stages of the disease, sometimes at the time of diagnosis. And this is usually called as mild cognitive impairment or mild memory impairment. In this study, we focus on um, examining a, a drug that's repurposed and, and previously used for um, for, to, for the treatment of epilepsy. It's called a drug called Leviteracetam. And it's been shown to reduce the risk of mild memory impairment in the dementia type of Alzheimer's disease. In here, we are trialing whether that drug reduces memory impairment in people with Parkinson's disease who have the potential to develop dementia at later stages. So this is a crossover clinical trial, um, a design with people receiving either the drug or a placebo. And the outcomes are, are look, we're looking at the outcomes using um, neuroimaging. Uh, I'm, I'm located at the University of Queensland Center for Clinical Research, which is at Hurston, and we have a fantastic neuroimaging facility where we can um, do, do brain imaging. The studies are guided by fMRI, so we basically uh, pe people with Parkinson's undergo uh, neuropsychological assessments, and once they're eligible for the study, they, we, um, we do neuroimaging using uh, MRI scanners, as you can see in this um, illustration. Inside the scanner, people do a task, which is particularly looking at their episodic memory impairment. And that's coupled to a specific part of the brain, which is called the hippocampus, and a subregion of the hippocampus, which is the DGCA3 region, that is activated um, in people who have early memory impairment. So what this drug does, uh, and we predict that the drug will reduce its activation and also uh, show behavioral outcomes in terms of reducing um, early episodic memory impairment. And then moving on to our dementia care projects, we have a range of interventions that we have developed to addressing challenging behaviors of concern and psychological symptoms in many people with dementia experience. Um, our interventions range from interventions to improve and enhance hospital stay in, in people with dementia when they come into hospitals, and particularly focusing on reducing delirium in hospital, which is another condition that we see um, often see coupled with people with dementia. And we also have projects to improve um, psychological symptoms and behaviors of concern in dementia in um, people living in residential aged care using technological innovations such as virtual reality. Our, our MRF funded project examines technology assisted and remotely delivered psychotherapy to reduce anxiety in people living with cognitive impairment, including um, people with mild cognitive impairment and dementia, um, to increase uh, a dispersal of psychological treatment and reaching out to uh, communities, uh, people living in uh, remote and uh, rural communities as well, and it's a national-wide project. Uh, with, within aged care, uh, there are a number of, a uh, lot of people, we, we know that about 70% of people 
with dementia living in aged care, unfortunately experience behaviors of concerns and psychological symptoms. And um, there are a number of issues that we can see in terms of aged care. And we have a project looking at um, improving uh, aged care behavioral and psychological symptoms from an industry specific point of view and developing a method to benchmark mental health care in aged care facilities and that's called our MHI care project. So in a nutshell, um, our, our projects look at both the dementia prevention as well as dementia care. We use um, novel technologies to uh, deliver the intervention as well as our state-of-the-art methods to uh, examine um, the outcomes of these clinical trials. Um, thank you, Gail. Um, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Thank you very much, Nadika. Um, I do have uh, one question here, which is, what are the benefits of repurposing drugs? Now, in terms of drug development, usually it takes um, a, lot, a number of years from preclinical stages to uh, human studies of clinical trials from phase uh, two to phase three, which usually drug development can take over 20 years or so. So repurposing meaning using an existing drug with known safety indications and using it to a different indication. So for example, the drug that we were trialing, um, we're trialing is called Libertarizantab, which is currently used for epilepsy and it's a drug that has been there for a very long period of time. So, and it's used in very high doses in, in epilepsy and we're using um, for in our study in very low doses and we know the safety uh, of this drug we know adverse effect what to expect so using a repurposed trial we can go straight into our phase to a clinical trial and reduce the time that usually takes for drug development by about three or four fold so we're expecting in another five years, we will be able to go into phase three clinical trials if this actually works mm -hmm. at our stages. So it reduces the length of time for a drug to go into the market for the policy indication. Great. Well, thank you very much, Nadika, for that talk and presentation today. I'm now going to turn to our final presentation. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Nancy Pahana, Professor of Clinical Geropsychology in the School of Psychology. She is co-director of the UQ Aging Mind Initiative. This provides a focal point for clinical translational aging related research at UQ. And she's program lead for UQ's Age Friendly University Initiatives. Her work is focused on geriatric mental health, particularly anxiety and driving in later life. Nancy, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail, and thank you again for the uh, invitation to present today. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a project that I'm doing with colleagues at James Cook University, um, Professor Eddie Strivens and Dr. Sarah Russell, and they're part of the Healthy Aging Research Team at James Cook. And what they're looking at is Indigenous health, Aging and Dementia in the Torres Strait. And this is a longstanding collaboration. Work has been going in the Torres Strait for about the last 15 years to examine issues of how chronic illnesses, emotional distress, impact um, risk of dementia. And also what sorts of um, interventions and community hopefully preventative strategies can reduce that risk of dementia and lead to improved quality of life and well-being for people living in the Torrey Strait. Now I'm actually going up to the Torrey Strait in a couple of weeks um, to Thursday Island, which is the center um, of our research program and also the site of the lovely Star of the Sea nursing home. And I don't know if people probably 
not that many people have been to the Torres Strait. It consists of 18 islands and um, five communities on the northern peninsula of Cape York. And people living in the Torres Strait uh, represent 7.4% of the total indigenous population in Australia. It's extremely important when looking at um, indigenous populations and looking at healthcare to really come to tailored community specific solutions. And thus the research really has to be place-based. And so the Healthy Aging Research Team, their goals are to develop models of healthy aging and address dementia risk in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And, and this is where my particular um, research expertise and interest comes in, to develop culturally appropriate assessment tools for older Aboriginal and Torres Strait adults living in far north Queensland. Now, while there have been, um, there's a, a long history of the development of cognitive assessment and say depression, anxiety, stress tools um, in various Aboriginal communities, particularly um, in the Kimberley, uh, it's really important, as I said, place-based solutions are best. And so we've devoted a lot of time and energy to developing tools that work in the Torrey Strait. And when you're developing these tools, you have to couch them, embed them in what is a sense of um, well-being and ill-being from an Indigenous perspective. And so you'll see on my slide a representation of a, a kind of holistic framing of well-being um, that includes, uh, as impacts on the self, connection to country, connection to spirit, connection to mind and body, and very importantly, connection to family and community. Connection to culture is key, and these are overlaid by historical determinants, so um, trauma in the past that is continuing on in, into the present, and social determinants. So income, for example, or, or inequities uh, in terms of access to uh, health care. So all of these things work together to determine, uh, for example, risk of a particular illness. So our data has shown that the prevalence of dementia is 14, a little over 14% higher in Torres Strait populations than in non-Indigenous populations. And when you adjust for age and some other factors, uh, it's particularly cerebrovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, relatively lower educational level, and problems with mobility and incontinence that are significantly associated with dementia. And these are particular issues um, that impact the wider well-being of communities on the Torres Strait because when people have, for example, diabetes um, or kidney disease, for example, and they need dialysis, they need to actually go off um, the Torres Strait Islands to the mainland to get treatment. So mental health, though, hasn't come up as a big factor. And we think that it's really uh, a failure, uh, particularly in our depression measures, to capture the full experience of um, Torres Strait Islanders' sense of depression, sadness, um, and hopelessness. And in particular, there are sensitivities about asking about hopelessness and thoughts of ending your life. And so what we're doing in our latest research is we're going to do some um, qualitative data collection from elders in the community, community leaders, um, and then just regular people from the Torres Strait community on what these sorts of issues, especially hopelessness and feelings of ending your life, um, what that means and how that can be phrased in a culturally sensitive way. This will then feed into a Delphi process with uh, experts in the area of mental health so we can phrase these questions in the best possible way to then be able to measure this more sensitively, more accurately in this community and look at the links between depression and uh, dementia. And then we're gonna pilot the tool. Um, I've developed a, a tool, the Geriatric Anxiety Inventory, which has a short form. And the questions are, uh, have been piloted in the, the Torrey Strait and the anxiety questions don't seem to be an issue. It's really the questions around uh, depression. 
I really feel privileged to be able to work on this project. Um, so often, as at the start of this lecture, we talk about um, you know, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. And, and I feel really privileged to try to pay back into a healthcare system that hopefully will address some of these real concerns about higher dementia risk in Torres Strait Islanders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. And um, I, I was just very interested in what you were saying about the measures for anxiety and depression and that it's easier to translate the questions we ask for anxiety into Torres Strait Islanders than the, the ones for depression. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, what's the difference in how depression is conceptualized or how do they think about it that's different, that's challenging for us to even know whether it's it's a risk factor for dementia or it's a risk factor for, for ill health or mental health? That's a great question. And as somebody who's translated the geriatric anxiety inventory into over 30 languages, uh, including Chinese, which is very uh, tricky, um, it's not so much a verbal translation because actually there are lots of different languages spoke in the, the Torres Strait, but there's kind of a common lingua franca um, which is Creole or Pidgin in the old conceptualization of it, but that Creole is, is a mixture of, of English uh, words and, and traditional words. And so when the, when the instruments are given, they're often given with a translator that can just adjust the language on the fly. And so mm -hmm. for anxiety, um, you know, we're talking about things like worry, and that seems to be a very straightforward concept, worry. Mm -hmm. uh, anxiety is sometimes a little bit different across cultures, but that doesn't seem to have been the case in the Torres Strait. With depression, certainly sadness, not feeling like doing activities, uh, feeling lethargic, these sorts of emotions clearly translate. It's the hopelessness and almost like the moral question of, will I admit to taking my life? And this is something we've debated a lot in the team. Do you really need that question to get to a diagnosis of depression? And so we've gone back and forth over a year, and that's really going to be um, the focus of the study. Is is And you also have to acknowledge that there's cohort effects, so people of different eras may have different feelings about being asked those questions and different um, willingnesses to be open about those issues. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Nancy. What, um, what I will do is just remind everybody that we actually are recording the webinar, so you'll be able to view this later on if you wanted to refresh any of the information. We've actually heard quite a lot of breadth. We've heard about a lot of uh, aspects of dementia research going right from the cellular molecular end and talking about tau and amyloid in the brain and also in the animal models as right through to the, the sort of care and talking about mental health and dementia in both um, many cultures, but particularly the indigenous cultures. So I want to just thank all speakers for introducing these ideas. And for all of you at home, please remember there's the little um, speech bubble that you can send us some questions. And at this point, I am going to open it up to uh, for different questions and comments. So I'm going to welcome back all the speakers together. And really, there's, there's a fundamental question here, which is, are there ways that we can slow or prevent dementia at the onset? So I can imagine, you know, we can go to you first, Jürgen, but then I certainly yeah. have my view in terms of yeah. different treatments. So we can talk about yeah. the pharmacological, and then we can talk about the behavioral. Mm. So Jürgen? Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting question. And basically, I mean, I have been arguing that you do not necessarily need to treat the disease. Basically, what you want is to delay the age of onset. Let's say I would become 90 years of age, and instead of developing Alzheimer's at 80, it would be pushed out to 90. Then I would never experience Alzheimer's. I think in order to really eradicate Alzheimer's disease, and again, linked to my core belief that amyloid and tau drive the degenerative process, that they are at the, at the cause of the degenerative process, 
I think the only way to really erase it would be to use a gene therapeutic approach. So one would have to to change the genes. Let's say when you think of someone where Alzheimer's disease runs in a family, there's the Swedish family, there's an Iowa family, there's an Icelandic family, <laughs> there are always different families where mutations have been identified. And in these families, uh, Alzheimer's disease runs in these families. And so ultimately in order to cure these, you could correct the gene mutation, maybe not in the germline, but maybe in the brain. And this is technically not, not feasible at the moment, but there's a lot of technology which would allow to do that. And I think that's one way to go. And otherwise is what we do is um, believing that amyloid and tau accumulate, you either want to block their formation or you want to facilitate in the clearance of toxic amyloid and toxic tau. And basically the latter is being done with the antibody approaches such as aducanumab, the anti-A beta antibody, where this antibody is injected into the bloodstream, a small fraction enters the brain and it clears then the amyloid and reduces it hopefully to levels which are then not toxic anymore. But again, I'm advocating ultrasound. I think ultrasound fundamentally is a technology which allows us not only to remove toxic amyloid and toxic tau, but it's almost acting like a cognition enhancement tool, which is also pushing. We, we talk a lot about cognitive reserve, and I think ultrasound is, is triggering mechanisms which might operate independent of amyloid and tau deposition. Uh -huh. And there's a slightly related question to the genes, which is, is there evidence that dementia is hereditary and can families be tested for it? So mm -hmm. I will open that up to anyone, but I, I think it's slightly related for you, Jürgen, unless... Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a small segment of one to five percent, and again, this is an estimate uh, of uh, familial Alzheimer mutations, basically families, where Alzheimer's disease is inherited in an autosomal uh, dominant fashion. But one should not forget there's also something which is called a, a risk gene. And we all know about APO lipoprotein E, APOE, and this is not an Alzheimer's gene per se, so it's not causing Alzheimer's, but it's simply depending on which type you got, it's increasing the risk. And there, there are there's genetic testing available. So just to give you an example, there's, there's APOE2, E3, E4. E3 is a common allele. E2 is the protective. E4 is the damaging. And when you got two E4 forms inherited from your mom and your dad, compared to having been inherited an E2 from both your mom and your dad, the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease is increased eightfold. And there are genetic tests, but the question is whether you want to be tested in the absence of a real therapy. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm going to um, ask a question of Nadika. And the question is, what are the outcome measures of the drug trial to reduce the risk of dementia in Parkinson's disease? So, um, may not commit the in our TRIPS study is we're looking at the specific subfield activation in the hippocampus, which is the part that is involved in memory, control memory in people. So this subfield, which is called the GGPA3 subfield, is activated, highly activated in those who have a particularly episodic memory impairment. So that is the, the activation uh, and that's, we examine that based on our neuroimaging where people perform a specific neuropsychological um, test, which, um, which is a, an episodic memory test looking at how people separate patterns, the pattern separate. And within that test, we can examine uh, impairment in pattern separation, which is uh, related to that activation in the brain. So that's the, the primary outcome measure of our study. We also look at the performance in the test 
that people do within the scanner and um, we examine the impairment in that way in terms of identifying um, new items, similar items and um, old items that are presented within the, the cognitive test. And uh, we examine how people um, perform that uh, item recognition and impairment that are related to item recognition, in particularly recognizing items that are presented um, as similar in comparison to new and items that are old uh, presented in a series of pictures that we present in the task. So, and that's uh, coupled with the neuroimaging activation. So, following on from that, Nadika, why are we targeting early memory impairment in Parkinson's disease? Why just memory? Why not other skills? That's right. So, memory is one of the most important um, aspects and one of the um, in most impaired uh, aspects in Parkinson's disease, even at a very early stages um, of Parkinson's disease. At the time of diagnosis, so there's research suggests that about 20% of people exhibit memory impairment. And I do understand there are other impairments like executive impairment, language impairment, visual spatial impairment, um, and attention impairments are present, but memory is something that's very common. And um, in people with, with a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease, which is a pre-stage of dementia, our studies demonstrate that about 40% of people have prominent memory impairment in Parkinson's disease. So memory is uh, one of the most impaired domains um, in Parkinson's and we're targeting that. And of course we understand there are other domains like executive functioning. So um, yes, that's sure. impaired. And this particular drug uh, that we're targeting is um, it's already shown in, um, in people with prodromal Alzheimer's disease or uh, who have episodic memory impairment, this drug can reduce that outcome measure of, uh, of the activation in the brain and it normalizes back into the normal levels of brain activation and in particularly DGPA3 a region of the hippocampus. Those so okay. why we data into um, our Parkinson's study and examine that. Okay, particular. thanks um, Nadika. I'm just looking at the, the questions coming in and I think I need to um, ask some of these. So there's a question here about whether someone, if you've always had poor memory, does this mean that they're able to, um, or they're going to develop dementia later? So if you've got poor memory young, are you going to develop dementia later? I can certainly comment on that, but Nancy, do you have a view on that? I certainly do have a view on it because my memory is terrible and it's always been terrible. And, um, and especially for uh, certain things like where I've left my car keys. Um, I think that there's this idea about, you know, if I have a bad memory, maybe that's some precursor. I, I don't really think that that's the case. Um, there are certainly, you know, a lot of um, examples that may be familiar to people of people who have had um, excellent memories, been very good at, at you know, writers and, and so forth that have then gone on to develop dementia. And so um, what I think is key is that if one has had a bad memory or disorganization and you want to give yourself the best chance of functioning irrespective of whether or not you are diagnosed with dementia, but certainly if you are diagnosed with dementia, putting in place organizational structures to improve your memory. Um, so having a place where you put your keys all of the time um, is a really practical functional um, strategy that, that you can uh, employ. Yes, absolutely. No, thank you, Nancy. You've just reminded me, you know, sometimes we set up memory stations for people. So in fact, you really, um, you put your things in the same place, same time. And this is also what we call executive functions. So this is the frontal lobes of the brain. What they do is help you 
organize information to get it into your memory store and then to retrieve it later sometimes you need a strategy or a way to find that again so you can use environmental ways to do that which is organizing your environment like nancy has suggested but you can also in a sense train your your brain and and optimize your cognitive health by by stimulating or doing exercises in the right way so training attention being able to be mindful you know i always say to people and i get asked this a lot if my memory is poor you know i never remember i got up from the armchair i went into the kitchen and i don't know why and i ask them what were you thinking about when you got up from the chair and went to the kitchen and often people actually were thinking about something else so to be very present in paying attention and concentrating on one thing at a time actually helps to optimize the memory uh, in the moment. And in fact, I've got another question here, which is asking, is the average GP able to diagnose the early stages of dementia and to differentiate the different kinds of dementia? And then following up from that, does UQ do cognitive testing and what does it entail? I think that actually is a question for me and that um, this is one of the focus of my research and no, it's very difficult for GPs. They have to be across everything. And often they only give a very broad brief, like a five minute cognitive screening tool. It would be a rare GP who really can diagnose dementia and detect that at the early stages. So it really does need specialist testing from, and Nadeek has talked about this, the neuropsychology end, where we're really looking at a broad range of cognitive skills and looking at whether that fulfills a criteria for a dementia diagnosis or not. And in fact, we do do that at UQ and we do that in my clinic. And, and that's what I mentioned at the very start. And I, I, I think that might be why the questions come up. Um, so we have a dementia diagnosis service if you're unable to obtain that via your GP or other area. So happy to have emails about that later. Let me turn to a different question and really ask, um, about this ultrasound, Jürgen, I want to follow up, and the question has also come in, does that ultrasound technology compare to standard drugs? Like, what's the difference between the drugs that are available and that technology? Um, this, this depends a bit on the modality which we are using. So basically, we use, or we can break up, or we can cate categorize ultrasound into three fundamental categories. So there's, on the one hand, the possibility to use ultrasound on its own, so ultrasound is then like a pressure wave which travels through the brain. Then the second modality is using ultrasound with micro bubbles and this interaction. So the micro bubbles are also used in a clinical setting as a contrast agent. So the micro bubbles are injected in the bloodstream, they go into the brain capillaries, ultrasound is delivered, ultrasound interacts with the circulating micro bubbles. And this then leads to a blood-brain barrier opening, which is transient and safe. And importantly, this then allows the uptake of naturally occurring therapeutic agents. This is what we have shown. So basically, the blood-brain blood barrier opens, and some factors enter the brain, which then stimulate uh, waste, waste removal cells, the microglia in the brain, to take up the amyloid and digest it. And the third modality is then there the line becomes blurry between using uh, ultrasound and a drug because where we would be using ultrasound together with micro bubbles and a therapeutic drug such as a, as an antibody a tucanema for example or we are also developing anti-tau antibodies in the lab and here one uses ultrasound with micro bubbles to open the blood brain barrier transiently which then allows an increased uptake of therapeutic antibodies such as aducanumab or tau. So we are basically have a whole arsenal of techniques which you can use. And we are entering the clinical trial initially only using by ultrasound on its own. We have shown in very old mice that this by itself can restore spatial memory in very old mice. So we are applying this in a safety trial in Alzheimer patients. We appreciate that at some point one would need to use ultrasound with micro bubbles and also with therapeutic antibodies, but it's a staggered approach to enter the clinical space. 
Actually, there's a follow-up question. I think you've answered it, but for those of us who don't speak um, basic neuroscience, I'm just going to ask oh. you whether, you know, how do the antibodies get across the blood-brain barrier? Is that this mm. micro bubble thing that you've just mentioned, or is it mm. something else? Um, there are multiple answers to be given to this question. So, firstly, we blood-brain barrier is not absolutely tight as you might think. So there are areas where the blood-brain barrier is leaky, the so-called uh, circumventricular organs, where the blood-brain barrier is already leaky so antibodies can enter. There are some active transport mechanisms and it's, it's for a long time it has not understood, and I think it's still true today, it has not been really understood how the antibodies actually work. For a while it was thought, initially when the field started, it, the idea was that the antibodies are in the brain and because there's an equilibrium between, let's say, amyloid in the brain and in the bloodstream, that this works like a sink. So basically you're draining amyloid from the blood, from the brain into the bloodstream because there's a gradient of different concentrations and the antibody then removes the amyloid in the bloodstream and that, this allows more amyloid to be drained from the brain into the bloodstream and we initially thought that ultrasound would work by following this principle but then we eventually found that ultrasound actually works by activating microglia which takes up the amyloid. Um, with the antibodies there's another thing that is that the antibody somehow needs to enter the brain but my personal view is that for the tau tangles which are forming inside nerve cells, which is different from the amyloid plaques which form outside nerve cells, I think the antibody does not only need to enter the brain, but it actually also needs to enter the nerve cell. So there are almost two barriers which have to be overcome. And my lab works actively in this area to find the solution for a more effective uptake of therapeutic antibodies, not only by the brain, but also by nerve cells. Fantastic. And a follow-up to that question is how far off human clinical trials of therapeutic ultrasound are we? Like, when will it happen, the human trials? Ah, that's an awful question. I don't like to, <laughs> to respond to that because I, I know I, I, we, 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 we have a clinical trial-ready design a device, as I've shown in, in, in my presentation. So the device has been built. It's clinical trial-ready. We are wrapping up the investigator brochure and the protocol. We are in the process of submitting to the human ethics, uh, human ethics committee. And then most likely the application will go back and forth. And then we would be ready to enter clinical trial. But I should warn everyone that this will only be a small trial. We will only enroll in all likelihood 12 participants. It's a safety trial and it's, it's exploring ultrasound only. Mm -hmm. And we use this as an entry point and a subsequent trial will then use uh, microbubbles to achieve blood brain barrier opening. I did not really answer the question, I understand, but no, <laughs> as close I, I as think it gets. Uh, I think I put yeah. you on the hot seat. It's, it's obviously a very difficult <laughs> yeah. question to, to yeah. answer. You I mean, know, I've got another question, which is whether there's an opportunity for people with dementia to be involved in UQ research studies. And I I think from all three, or in fact myself as well, all of us would say yes, absolutely. Perhaps if and I just, um, yes, so I, I would say there is an opportunity to be involved in both the, the dementia safety trials, but also the mm -hmm. cognitive neuropsychology clinical trials, the care trials. So please just send an email follow up to the webinar because I think all of us would welcome volunteers and we're always looking for participants. So that's a yes. Um, yeah, we, we, we got, uh, we got a, um, 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 a, a principal investigator for the clinical trial and so he's most likely the best person to contact. Great, thank you. And I think all of us would be running things. So if you want to be involved in increasing your cognition, that would be me if you want to be involved in aging and mental health with anxiety, then um, Nadika and Nancy. So please just feel free to contact or ask it in a question and we'll respond to you. So Nancy, I just want to come back to, to your other role in terms of UQ. And 
you know, we hear about this age-friendly university. What, what's our community in, at UQ doing to reach out to other people living with dementia? Like, are we doing something in particular or what is that all about? Well, I think that this follows on from the previous question. You know, people were asking about becoming involved in clinical trials. I think there are other ways that people living with dementia, the care partners, and that even concerned members of the public can get involved. So there is a patient and care advisory board set up at UQ where th this is an advisory board for researchers um, investigating a wide range of issues uh, regarding dementia. And this advisory board helps to um, give input into things like measurement issues or, or just uh, general concerns. And I think getting involved in these kind of initiatives is key. Um, the other thing that's happening at UQ in the dementia space is I'm very pleased to report just news in this week that our UQ Art Museum and the UQ Healthy Living Center, which is in Tuang, and which is open to people over age 50 um, who want to become uh, healthy and fit. Both of these institutions have been declared um, dementia um, inclusive, and there, it's, it's a title that means that we're constantly evolving towards becoming uh, increasingly dementia inclusive, but they've received that um, from Dementia Australia. And we think it's really important at UQ that our, especially our outward facing institutions um, are dementia inclusive. And this is part of the general um, age friendly university initiative to make sure that older adults and all older adults um, in the community feel welcome on campus, um, that mature age students um, feel part of our community and that our research and our teaching um, definitely take account of the issues that are facing society um, today and older people in general. The decade right. 2021 to 2030 is the UN declared um, decade of healthy aging and UQ is pleased to be a part of that. Right, thank you, Nancy. In fact, we're coming up to um, our closing time and I think, you know, what I've heard today is really reassuring me and showing me just how broad the research really is at UQ and you know that it's so important to do the fundamental basic neuroscience at that cellular and molecular level which we've heard from uh, Professor Gotts and then also to really think about how are we measuring these things not just in the communities in Brisbane but up in you know the communities like the Torres Strait Islanders. I think that's been brilliant. And then, um, you know, we've heard from Nadika about just the, the range of things that can be done and what is being do, done in terms of care, prevention, repurposing drugs. So there's a lot of creativity in what's happening. And I, I always feel very optimistic and very hopeful about the future when I hear this, because with institutes like the Queensland Brain Institute, plus the medical faculties, plus the behavioral sciences faculties, you know, coming together, talking about the ideas is really dynamic. And I think that's where we start to generate new ideas from each other. So that's the process. So at this point, I just want to thank our speakers for their time and for their sharing their ideas and also for the audience. Wow, I've just I've been amazed at all the questions coming in. It's been wonderful. So thank you. And remember, we're recording this webinar. It's been live, but you can watch it at any point. And please um, email us, find us at UQ, and you can always find us from the Queensland Brain Institute or the faculties. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.